Music is very important to us. We are a singing people, okay? And uh, the fact that you speak about singing, we're not going to sing because we want to sing. We are a singing nation. When there's a funeral, we sing. Uh, when a child is born, we sing. So singing to us permeates our whole entire life. Be it happy, be it uh, sad, or any occasion, a wedding, we are always involved in singing. I don't say we're not, we couldn't feel the strain of apartheid, but we broke this anger through singing. It lightened the burden that was there. taught this song as, as children, you know, uh, and at the time we didn't realize that it was something that was done as part of a, a, a liberation struggle, you know, but we grew up knowing Kosi After 1948, when the apartheid regime came in, uh, they, they, they realized the message, but because anything really African, indigenous African, was taboo at the time, then, you know, they banned it. Africa. You just were not supposed to sing it, uh, otherwise you got arrested. You know, I mean, South Africa was very ridiculous, you know, a lot of things you just got arrested. You know, it was the answer to everything for them. require, want the franchise on the basis of one man, one vote. They want political independence. What you saw throughout the 50s was the defiance campaign, for instance. The volunteers led by the likes of Mandela, Lutuli, the volunteers would be accompanied by singers and dancers, and they would be singing and dancing because that would give them courage, that would inspire them in their campaign. Later on you had the prison trial where 156 uh, leaders were being uh, uh, charged for treason. There was song and dance in the courtrooms, in the cells, their supporters, and so on and so on. The 60s perhaps come, come out much more clearer because then the liberation movements were, were banned, leaders were exiled, and jailed, and there was a political law. After the 1976 troubles, when thousands of young people escaped, went into exile, and joined the ANC, that the ANC began to realize the strength of the arts, the strength of culture, 
as a vehicle to mobilize people, as a vehicle to raise awareness worldwide, even internally, that the, uh, the ANC then deliberately formed a cultural group called Amandla. Because that realization comes out of what happened throughout the 60s and, and the 70s in South Africa. Powerful mobilizing instrument that the ANC has ever had, you know, because uh, it was entertainment. You know, we were telling the people about the struggle in South Africa whilst entertaining them, and uh, we would get all the other written material, and the people would just eat it up and buy it, everything. And people would be coming to me and asking, "Is what we are seeing real, or is it just fiction? Is this just a story?" I said, "No, this is exactly what is happening." in South Africa. This is the history of South Africa, you know, and uh, people would be saying, how can we help? against odds and even me as a student uh, I got a bursary to study the violin and all the violin teachers white teachers in town would not have me because they said no can a black man study the violin and others used to excuse it so my neighbors will be surprised and uh, it won't be nice to see this black boy coming every week for a lesson until this one white man took me on as a student, he's a professor of violin now and he's going to America. Uh, each time I went for a lesson, the hustle I had was with the police now. The police would see young black men, not a violin or a machine gun, so I would be stopped. So you open up, let's see. And when I open, it's a violin. And they would ask, whose is it? I said, it's mine. They said, no, but a black man can't play the violin. Play, let's hear, so that we prove that it's yours, it's not stolen. Then I've got a tune right in the middle of the street. And I would think, what do I play? I can't play in any bar and a company. It is an Afrikaner, he won't understand anything. Oh, let me play one of his folk songs. So I'll just st st strum along one of the f African folk songs. Then he would smile and call his colleague, Carniers, come and listen. Then he says, start again. And I would start again. He said, pat me on the back, okay. Go, Blackie. Look, Mark Afriki, Jeep, spill by a boy. Then that's how I get my freedom. But yes, it's true that uh, uh, it was thought that we as blacks could not play an instrument like that. It was meant for a certain class of people to play. In September of 1960, I landed in New York. A lot of uh, exiles stayed uh, uh, abroad because they became part of the communities. But Jonas and I, for instance, were roommates and uh, we were fascinated with everything that was happening on hour on the hour. Even though we were physically in the States, our hearts and minds were here. And um, uh, the biggest longing we had in our hearts was to come back here. And uh, we stayed another 27 years. Um, abroad, but when we were students, we had an FBI car parked outside our apartment at 310 West 87th all the time. We'd call the police, they'd come and talk to them, and they'd go around the block and come back again. And they knew everything we were doing, our, 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 our phones were bugged. And when we got our residencies, uh, uh, we were listed as communists, which was like having the bubonic plague in the 60s, in our, uh, especially in America. 
And uh, of course, when we asked them where they got that report that we were communists from, they said from the South African special.